busy. Yeah. Busy is busy is an understatement. Uh, better than the alternative, right? <laughs> That's right. You want to come back is. and talk Absolutely. to our group again? Absolutely. We're too long. We got a lot more stuff to talk about in this yeah. one, man. We got really cool We're stuff. Why don't we go break ground on the 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 movie theater, the drive-in? Uh, actually, the end of the, the end of November. Oh, okay. To the day. And they're going to be. Well, they're, they're doing one in Rockwall. They're, they're trying, trying to finish it. The first was the date. Was the date. And, and I asked him if it was the date. Is that a joke? And he goes, "What do you mean?" <laughs> 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 All right, that's that's much better. Is that what they're talking April first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi, Haley. Oh, 4 p.m. The Louisville Planning and Zoning Commission meeting workshop session is now called to order and there is a quorum present. Item number two is review and discussion of agenda items. I'll turn that over to staff. Uh, first item, what we wanted to do, uh, yeah, not, I don't know, it's going to take an agenda, and uh, we should have it's not included on. there, okay. Uh, the item that we really would like to discuss is the uh, zoning case on your agenda, mainly because it is a very complicated uh, zoning. It's fairly large and it's a planned development uh, with a lot of details involved, as uh, you've seen in the packet. So what we would like to do is actually go through the various uh, uh, zones within the development, the various development criteria, and give you uh, an opportunity to uh, ask questions, voice any concerns you may have, uh, uh, give uh, input in terms of changes, if you'd like to see any changes, uh, and at the same time, uh, give the developers an opportunity to also put before you where they are coming from and why they're proposing what they're proposing. Before they get into it and I introduce them, uh, I also want to reiterate that this has been part of our I-35 redevelopment plan for this area that's been zoned like <coughs> industrial for probably the past 15 years, 15 to 20 years, and we've always wanted to turn it into a gateway development as a mixed-use development, a neighborhood, something that as you come into Louisville, you would see something a lot more than just big box buildings. And uh, also within the vision 2025, this area was identified as something more than just a light industrial area. So with that, we've been holding charrette with various property owners uh, to kind of brainstorm on what this property can be. As part of that charrette, uh, Pro Lodges, who was the largest holding property owner in this area with light industrial zoning, had decided to put the property up for sale. We were very fortunate that a uh, a very experienced developer had decided to actually take on the property, and it's Mr. Stephen Williamson, who has Thank had <laughs> projects uh, <laughs> before in Farman, and he also has several projects in the, in the Metroplex, and is extremely uh, in favor of doing neighborhoods and doing mixed-use developments and doing things that are a little different than your run-of-the-mill so. development. With that, I'd like to introduce his land planner, who is, again has his own huge credentials bringing to this project, Mr. Dan Quinto, who was the land planner for South Lake Square, uh, the, the Flower Mound Lakeside development. So he, he, he has a, a huge amount of experience in, in, uh, in uh, doing uh, form-based codes and mixed-use developments. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dan. I would like to say that as a matter of uh, the course and agenda, we want this at this time because, again, this is such a major large zoning case uh, that we would like to have this workshop, continue the public hearing till the next meeting so everybody would have had a chance to absorb all the information again, have any questions, and we're still working through some issues, so we want to resolve issues before we actually come back and ask you to act on the zoning case. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the PNZ, we will have the workshop, but when you go into the meeting, although we have it on the agenda, uh, we would like to request that it be, the public hearing be opened and continue to November 3rd meeting. Okay. So with that, Dad. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for giving us the opportunity here. Um, my name is Dan Quinto. Uh, I've been <coughs> as, uh, the second or third or fourth project I've been doing with um, working with uh, Stephen Williamson. Um, 
what I want to do tonight is just run through a couple of items. I want to go through, you know, kind of an introduction to us in terms of our um, our experience. It's a screen, so ah, that's so, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's you touch it all. okay. Um, run through some of um, prior projects that I thought were applicable here, and then talk about the existing site. I think everybody's familiar with that, so we'll zip over that, um, and then go through the components of the code. Um, I went into uh, greater detail when I briefed uh, staff um, that I'm going to do right now so that we can have time for questions and answers. Um, but these are the components uh, of the staff in terms of zones, uh, open space, streets, um, thoroughfares, oops, pedestrian network, there we go again, um, <clears throat> and lot types and building types. Um, so just to get on with it. Um, Stephen has been graduated from University of Chicago with an MBA. Uh, he's been doing real estate in Dallas for 30 years, um, experienced in all kinds of uh, development, residential, medical, retail, office, and so on. Um, no outside investors, I'm speaking for you, so okay. well, that's, <laughs> <I'm getting laughs> that's exactly um, right. And um, uh, there's the, the Dallas portfolio, um, over 250 acres of commercial development. Um, there's a Louisiana portfolio as well, which is um, more timberland and farmland. Um, there's no debt on any of the current projects, and the current development includes all of these projects that you see here, uh, the West Side Market in Frisco, the Starwood Village, the MacArthur Village, and so on. Then we get to me, um, not trying to you know, pad my resume, I just want you to feel comfortable that you've been here before. Um, I'm an architect, I'm also a, a real estate agent, um, and I want to talk about a couple of the projects that I've, I've done in the past. Um, South Lake Town Square, which is 100 acres of mixed use with no residential, um, that was what brought me to Texas from um, uh, Disney, from Florida. Um, hometown, which was 300 acres of mixed use uh, under construction. Um, Belmont, 1,000 acres in Argyle and North Lake. Um, now it's uh, now it's called Harvest. Um, Chisholm Trail Ranch worked on zoning and uh, design guidelines. That's uh, 600 acres in Fort Worth, mixed use. Um, Lakeside DFW, 155 acres of mixed use in, in uh, Flower Mound. Uh, Southgate, uh, about 108 acres in Flower Mound, also mixed use. Um, the Riverwalk in Euless, um, Bear Creek Riverwalk, which is um, also a mixed use development commercial along uh, 83, uh, 183 and uh, 360. And um, the lofts of Main Street and Mansfield, <coughs> which is, I think, particularly apropos because they have a, a, a historic downtown. We were looking at kind of an extension of that downtown by adding um, higher density residential to kind of stretch the, the market and the uh, downtown. <coughs> and I'm, I'm happy to talk about any of those uh, if you want more information about them. I know you're all familiar with form based codes, just want to hit some of the hot buttons. Um, traditional zoning, you know, focuses on land use, segregation of uses, buffers, and so on. Uh, form based codes, um, <coughs> they're focused on the, the drive lanes and make sure they're, they're traffic calmed, the on street parking, the streetscape. <coughs> Gotta stay away from that guy. <laughs> Uh, the, the streetscape, which is that portion between the curb and the building, and then the building itself, and the form of the building and the uses within the building. Um, so pedestrians are a higher priority. Um, what's especially important in form-based codes is block structure. So you want the buildings around the perimeter of the block, the parking on the interior of the block, so that you're keeping uh, the perimeter of block for streets and sidewalks and pedestrian activity. So here's the site and the challenges um, to creating a kind of a strong block structure. Um, 
there's the outline of the um, tract in, in question. We've got retail office, single family down here, multifamily over here. Um, so multiplicity of uses. Um, if you look at the survey, um, you'll see some of the obstacles we have to making this kind of one single <coughs> integrated neighborhood. Um, we've got a gas easement here. We've got a, a well site. Let's see if I can get more out of your way. Um, we've got a uh, drainage easement in detention. We've got a uh, drainage easement cutting that site in half. We've got uh, utility easement chopping off the bottom corner. Uh, telecom easement taking up a pretty good chunk there. Um, and of course the railroad along the southern boundary. <coughs> These are the available if we want three entrances. This is sort of where they have to go. They can't get three without uh, with a different configuration. If we switch to two uh, entrances, then we can't use the existing median brakes. <coughs> Uh, on Summit, those are the existing median breaks. We want to kind of marry those up to where we're planning entrances on that side. Um, so we get um, kind of the, the, the uses that we think make sense on the site. So more commercial facing 35, less commercial as you go deeper into the site and to get to single family on the southern boundary. So these are the zones, <coughs> and the idea is there's, uh, each zone has a designation, zone one, Z1, Z2, Z3, four, five, and six. Each zone <coughs> has uh, an estimated area, a maximum area, a minimum area, so that they're, they're allowed a little bit of flexibility as we go through the design process. Um, the open space is also numbered, divided this into two pieces, um, so we have uh, the area where the detention pond is, and then the area around the detention pond. And what we're, <coughs> what we're looking forward to is being able to uh, provide some kind of <clears throat> amenity within those areas, even though the restrictions on the land uh, currently say you, you can't make any improvements. So we're looking at um, kind of revisiting those uh, easements. Um, each of the open spaces has uh, a series of requirements and a series of permitted uh, um, amenities. So for instance, tables and chairs would be okay in one kind of a park, but would be inappropriate in this park where you have picnic tables. It's a different kind of a character to the open space. <coughs> Streets and thoroughfares. In order to get this to work as blocks, we see this as being a one, one block, big enough to get one block here, not really big enough to get two blocks, um, particularly because of some of these easements and drainage areas. So we want to be able to leave enough room for parking along this side, streets here, block here, and then frontage along this side, and then this would be its own block. This surrounded by Open space street street would be one block, and then this would be another block, and then this has its own breakdown into, into blocks. Um, what happens on street one, because of where it's situated right on the boundary with the northern property, uh, what we were trying to do as we developed this plan is to make sure that as we develop out, the northern property develops out in a compatible way. <coughs> so we, we kind of wanted to make sure that as whatever we did on that boundary also served the development on that north side. So right now there's a drainage easement that runs through that center and it's a ditch. Um, so one option is to treat that ditch as a canal and put one-way traffic on each side so you get a couplet. Um, the property line runs right down the center of it. So this could be, you know, 
may not look exactly like Amsterdam, but <laughs> the idea is that if you make a feature of it yeah. um, so that it's attractive. If we don't do it that way, we'll have to turn and turn our backs to it so that it becomes uh, less noticeable as just a drainage feature so that the fronts of the buildings then face the other side. And that means if we turn our backs to it, then it's likely that the north side will also turn its back. <coughs> and then on summit, also once again, we're trying to tie this all together. So the idea is to um, make summit at least partially uh, more of a uh, pedestrian-oriented street. So you have on-street parking, sidewalks and street trees along the perimeter. Uh, two lanes of traffic. So you're not changing the capacity of the street, but you are changing the character of the street. Uh, also considered the possibility of putting in a brown effect at the major intersection. <coughs> the uh, pedestrian network, um, because of the kind of specific character of the site, the pedestrian network and the street network are not married. Um, so the, uh, there are areas where there's uh, required trails where there are no streets. And there are areas where there are, uh, there are streets without trails. So um, the blue represents required pedestrian connections. The green represents uh, pedestrian connections, some portion of which is required, some percentage of that is required as the project develops out. And the brown is um, uh, uh, sidewalks that are either on town property or part of uh, the town's master plan. So this is uh, part of the uh, trail master plan. I'm going to go <coughs> and again, we're cognizant of leaving openings to, to, the, to the property to the north. These are excerpts from uh, previous concept plans. So I just wanted to demonstrate how it, how it would match up with uh, those, those plans. So what Dan is referencing, we held a city sponsor charrette with all the property owners in that area with the planner that we had hired, uh, actually the planner that did the I-35 plan. And so as part of that, we came up with our own plan, and then we wanted any developer that would come <coughs> and match that plan. So that's what that's referencing. Uh, there is a set of rules about facades. Um, so the, the bottom portion um, has to do with that section where it's along the sidewalk and it's pedestrian friendly. So there's a, a minimum amount of glass area, uh, minimum access off the sidewalk through the building into the in, in front doors. And then the upper section also has minimum and maximum glass areas. Um, we have um, uh, kind of a definition about how that gets treated. Um, and then there's building types. And this is kind of the basis for a lot of what is in the, in the code. We have, <clears throat> we're defining seven building types. The first building type is basically your conventional suburban office building. It's office on all floors, on the ground floor, interior access to those offices. The second category are commercial over commercial mixed use. So you would have uh, office, office, and then on the ground floor, those ground floor offices would be accessed from the sidewalk. Um, and they can be offices or retail or restaurants. Building three is living, I'll get the hang of this yet, uh, living, living over, re over commercial. And then living, living over live work unit, and we're we're treating, um, we, want a, we want a category that allows uh, the building to function as a commercial ground floor. Uh, that is to say, it has shop windows, it has entrance off the sidewalk and so forth, um, but does, doesn't necessarily have 
you know, soft goods or restaurants. Um, so that's a live work unit. Somebody could live there, open up a business, have um, it's a psychologist or um, an artist. Artist, exactly. Architect. Or an architect. <laughs> um, and then the, the fifth category is just the straight up um, urban uh, urban residential building. Uh, then you get into uh, six is a townhome, seven is a single family detached. And these are some pictures of, I have more pictures coming up, um, building type one, and then this is in the code of uh, what's required in terms of um, masonry, ground, ground floor <coughs> glazing, upper floor glazing, height limits, and so on. Um, some examples of building type one. Um, you can see landscaping around, you know, parking lots. Um, building type two, where you have offices <laughs> over either retail or other offices. <laughs> building type three, where you have um, live, living units over commercial. And these are all projects that I've, I've uh, <coughs> worked on. And then you have, I didn't work on this one. Uh, um, then you have um, uh, living over live work units where you have access to the ground floor, um, but that ground floor is not necessarily commercial. And then these are the urban residential. So it's designed to go to the perimeter of the block, kind of act as the the boundary to that private area um, and really set up that street wall so that you have a nice uh, streetscape. And it really reinforces that, that neighborhood feel. Single family townhomes, um, I would say a wide variety of uh, possibilities there. And um, single family detached. Um, these are some of the houses that we did in um, Lakeside, um, Lakeside here also. Um, just wanted to kind of circle back to the origin and discuss why, <laughs> why bother with all this um, and not just leave it um, uh, light industrial. There's um, advantages to the city. Um, economic development is one of the reasons, one of the basic reasons. Um, if you look at all the major employment centers in Dallas-Fort Worth and really around the country, they're located in areas that are uh, very rich in uh, amenities and densities and things to walk to, uh, like restaurants and hotels and so forth. And those areas also attract the, that young professional demographic that wants uh, the option of being able to live without a car. Um, it's also sustainable. Um, Council of Governments has um, a, a program of design excellence, and uh, they are uh, identifying mixed use and um, uh, transit-oriented development as a method of uh, improving the efficiency and sustainability of development. Uh, Leeds also has uh, a program with, for that, and it enhances the character. It's a, it's a kind of a cool place uh, to live um, if it if it functions um, as planned. So this is the the concept plan. Um, the idea is uh, you have your commercial corridor, uh, commercial corridor along here. Live work is required along here. Um, and then these are a little bit more flexible in terms of what kind of housing it is. Um, and then along here, it's uh, required to be single family. Because it spaces the single family uh, across the, the uh, road. So um, I wanted to get through it quickly so we would have time for questions. I know there's a lot to digest there. Um, the presentation to staff had a lot more kind of a technical discussion of the mechanics of the, um, you know, what's, 
what's permitted in one place and what's prohibited in another place. Um, and that took, I think, an hour and a half. Um, so I'm, um, I'm happy to be able to do it. In I just want to add that the base zoning for this district is also our own mixed use district standards. So basically, whatever that you don't see here, that means the city requirements take over, basically, supersede. So there are things that are described specifically here that would be specifically for this development. But the fact that our mixed use district is, is our base zoning gives us a lot of comfort level in terms of the development criteria and, and what needs to, to be part of that criteria. Uh, Dan, one thing I would like you to touch on just uh, for the commission to be aware of, what will decide at the end that the maximum will produce number of, if you could come touch on the number of residential units, number of, uh, or square footage of commercial space, and those um, possibilities. I know it was on one of the pages, but. Yes. Um, we didn't add, we didn't total them, um, but on page three, um, there's a maximum residential units <coughs> per, uh, per zone. Per zone, okay. Um, and you, you can't build the max in every zone because it assumes you're maxing out the area as well. So, um, you know, if you there's a maximum in for each of the areas. So you can't just uh, go across there and add up the total. Um, but we could we could probably establish a total. If, uh, if that needs to be done. Probably that's not a bad idea to do that. Also come up with a total for the office mm -hmm. and the townhomes detached and attached units possibilities. So, I think so. Have those numbers. All right. so those are some of the things, again, we are uh, working to get you, a, a, you know, this, this plan gets more detailed and more detailed. We want you to have all the information before you make a decision. Uh, so that's primarily for having this work session now and then coming back for the, for the approval of the next week, or two weeks. So with that, any questions, any comments? How close is the gas well you, we were talking about earlier? Um, I kept the distance um, the same all around. So whatever it is there and there, it is also there. Okay. The well site itself, I think, is about... This is 700 foot from the property line. So that whole green space that you see, I think they, you know, they have purchased that whole entire area. The, the, That's the, all the site's was, about five acres. Five acres. For that but the work <laughs> itself is way on the on the okay. edge of the property. What about ingress and egress and access to 35? Well, let me go back to. Uh, So um, we're anticipating that this is the, well, the, is the street section we're hoping for. Okay. Um, so that would be a two-way ingress and egress. There would be ingress and egress here as well. Um, and then the third one. Um, and I went over that with uh, Richard. We looked at the I-35. Um, build out, ultimate build out, and it looks as though those are feasible. Um, we're leaving all the existing uh, curb cuts, not messing with any of those. Uh, medium cuts, I mean. Um, on Summit. On, on Summit, summit. Yeah. right. And then there are only two places to get in over here around the gas well. I think there's one curb cut here in the middle of the gas well now. Um, but if yeah, you know, I didn't even touch it that time. You have to get close, just close um, enough. It's your vibe. Um, but those are the only two possibilities. Um, so we obviously can't go through. So I'm anymore. concerned about thirty, the thirty-five, uh, the access road there, or and access to, and when they come out of the property or into the property, there's going to be light there, or we're going to, it's going to be just. Well, this is, of course, one-way traffic right. on I-35, so, so it's, right. it's very, very yeah. kind of self-contained. Yeah. So It'll generally, right in, right out. Right. Okay. Yeah. You wouldn't have that. Okay. Service um, road would be two lane anyway, or minimum two lanes. Right. Um, 
and then of course we are the summit is primarily going to be where where the interior is going to traverse okay. through and go all the way up to Garden Ridge and okay. Seven, and then come back at the light Got basically. It. So is the idea primarily to have this accessible by vehicles, or is this like a multimodal? Yeah. Or are you trying? This to would be this would be an attractor for people <coughs> outside of the development to come, um, and this would be. You know, these people can walk there, but in my experience, um, when you're doing mixed-use development, you still assume everybody arrives by car. Okay. Well, um, like with Summit, that's a four-lane divided, yes. and we're adding on-street parking on both sides, right? Yes. Okay. So, is there any way to that we could narrow that street through I there, just to. to make it a little more? That, yeah, just to I calm would, it a little and to make it more to. less of a barrier because it almost seems like mm -hmm. it divides the whole uh, thing into two pieces. I would love to. Um, the um, um, <coughs> the red is added curve, the yellow is um, subtracted. Um, so you're cutting the curve in this way or popping the curve out where it's red. Um, cost was the reason I left the two lanes. Yeah. Um, but yes, I would, what we did in uh, uh, Lakeside, uh, they had three, <coughs> um, three 12 foot lanes. So we put in um, headed, angled in parking, um, which left, which took up 18 feet, which left another 18 feet. Um, so we left that 18 feet as one lane. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility was putting in um, the parallel parking and leaving the two lanes. Um, it's not a bad solution to, I mean, the, 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 the cost of actually removing the lane, I don't know, we, you know, this is cutting it back and maybe it would be, just have to see how the, how the dollars work. Well, I'm not necessarily talking about removing a lane, um, but there's a really wide median there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a that's a big barrier for a it pedestrian is. to cross. It is. I and agree. are you talking about doing bike lanes on that street too? It should. It seems like it that open space is going to pull to that in. Yes, it would be very desirable to have what are referred to as complete streets. I think those are some of the items we can look at is because not only it's a, it's a major thoroughfare, it's going to carry a lot of traffic. So our engineers would have some, of course, input and say into what, what can be done. Just having parking on either side of the street does do provide some traffic calming. Well, this so because be done you, have, in, you have, you know, parked cars on, on, on the sides mm -hmm. of the street. The wide median actually is going to act more of a, as a, Parkway landscape buffer. You just need to enhance that that median. It's a uh, refuge as you cross two lanes. Crossing, exactly. Stop and so, so, but those are those are things that we can absolutely look at as we as we move closer to to engineering and design on the project. And how is this going to be phased? That was my question. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you don't steal your but I got another one. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, you want to? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. That's okay. Oh. The the only user that I have contacted so far is a townhouse user uh, who would go against the railroad track. Uh, I will build some and I, I will sell some of the land to other developers. And until I really know what I have, I don't, I, I can't plan that too well. Okay. But our intent um, it is to move quickly and get a lot going on quickly. I, I very much would, would like to make a lot of progress on this project during this economic cycle. Sure. The market is good. Uh, I think we can get a lot done in the next two or three years. You know, that was going to be my next question was what are you seeing as the build out date, like 2017, 18, something like that? If the market continues, if the market continues to hold uh, three or four years, okay. uh, I'll just put in my two cents, which probably is different from what Stephen thinks. But uh, I, I think we ought to start on the sum, on the uh, on the west side, 
and work toward the east so that um, you're, you're more likely to get uh, better retail and office users if you've already got some mass here. Mm -hmm. They don't like to go into the, the cornfield. Yeah. Right. That uh, was, was one thing we experienced on our Flower Mountain project. We, we had had uh, oh, the, the idea of a, a kind of an urbanized mixed-use project. Is that like Sun? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. The, the, that's, the, that's another project that, that Dan's working on. And, and the town had been very much in favor of that. I had a hotel lined up to go there. And then the town kind of went another direction, turning the project more into a, kind of a typical suburban uh, type development. Uh, it, it will still be a very nice development. It will still be successful. <coughs> But, for instance, when we took out the high-density residential, uh, that impacted the, the sorts of restaurants and sure. shops that might go there. And the hotel said, hey, look, we're just not interested unless you bring the total package together. And, and yeah, we need the high-density. The, no. the, 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 the total vision of the project changed kind of midstream. Is that the one that they're on twenty four ninety nine? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the Southgate project. Uh, this is twenty four ninety nine. This is Giroux, the Grapevine Golf Course. That's right. Right. We'll never get that right. Um, and, and we have some good things going on there, but it, it's just not the project that Dan and I wanted to be. It's there's sort of a difference between mixed use and mixed zoning. Um, and it, where it was mixed use, where you actually had, you know, a real integration of the uses, um, now there's kind of a single family pod. I think where we're going is basically we'd like to create that mixed use, or they would like to create that mixed use, true mixed use as part of this project. And of course, again, getting some of those uses, it all depends on what kind of package uh, is in place for the entire property. What are you thinking about signage for this? I haven't gotten there yet. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll be just... Be yeah, and we generally try because our sign ordinance is completely separate from our zoning ordinance. And so we generally try not to tackle that at the time of zoning. Mm -hmm. When they come in, they either bring in again their own sign package that goes to the <coughs> council directly if it's different from our ordinances or they comply with the city ordinances. I, I could see there being um, on west of Summit to have individual sign packages, but I think on the east side of Summit, you'd want a unified, uh, unified deal. <coughs> There's any kind of a barrier for, uh, for the homes that are going to be right up against the railroad track? How is that having that their boundary? Um, there is uh, quite a good distance between the track and the uh, first available site to build on. Um, that is about 60 feet. I, I want to say 60 feet. Okay. Um, and, <coughs> and then we'll, you know, we'll get with the builder and, and see what the, uh, what the requirements will be. Okay. All right, any other questions? No, sir. Okay. okay, this time I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Sean. <laughs> Seconded by Kristen. Those in favor, signify aye. 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 Motion carries, meeting adjourned.